our last speaker before we break for uh, morning tea is the one and only Rosie Batty. She is here, I mean, we all know Rosie, but she's here today um, representing the Victim Survivor Advisory Council. She is, of course, our 2015 Australian of the Year. Rosie is a leader in the crusade against domestic violence and has turned her personal tragedy into a fight to help others. Rosie now champions efforts in the fight against domestic violence. Her public speaking appearances are a remarkable story of resilience and courage and they shine a spotlight on the issue and call for systemic changes. If there was anyone in the media in the last few years who showed us that the system was broken, I think we'd all agree that it was Rosie. Rosie's incredible strength and selfless efforts are an inspiration to many people and we are so thrilled to have her here today on one of her few current public speaking, uh, what do we call it, forays? I don't know if that's the right word, but either way, we're thrilled to have you. Please welcome Rosie Batty. on my feet. I'm getting old. Um, it is so good to be here and it is so good to be here at an event that is so really, really important. I've got my watch. Nelly, you're not going to ring that bell on me. Um, thank you, Caroline, for that welcome to country. I travel extensively, many areas of Australia, remote, regional. It has been an absolute privilege for me to more deeply understand and connect with Aboriginal women. I am quite clear that the reason I've been able to have a voice is because I'm a white, privileged, middle-class, educated woman. There are so, so many women that will be coming into your hospitals on a daily basis that have, I believe, no hope, no version or view of a, pre of a better life ahead and feel predetermined or desperate that this, what they're experiencing is what they either deserve and how to take a road towards safety, towards um, a life that we would perhaps expect to take for granted seems to be beyond so many women. I've travelled to Papua New Guinea. 70% of women will be raped. 70%. One in two women will experience horrendous violence. That's our closest neighbour. Corrupt government and the only hope that they have of intervention and support is funded by the Australian government. I still feel so passionate about this. And Nelly, you're doing a great job as an MC. As women, we should be absolutely enraged. Enraged that we have one woman a week being murdered every week. And you're absolutely right. Now, this is not family violence. This is family terrorism. If we use that word more often, you would see a lot more money being spent. I'm probably like the rest of you last week, lo looking at what was unfolding in Canberra with utter dismay, disbelief, and then genuine sadness. There are many issues that politicians have to face, but it's an absolute bloody struggle to keep family violence up there. When I was Australian of the Year in 2015, I didn't put my hand up for that job. I really didn't think I was worthy. But when I was chosen, I knew I had a moment in time to do whatever I could to start a conversation I spoke at over 250 events, and I can tell you I spoke at a lot of medical conferences because I saw the medical sector as an incredibly important part of the solution. I also speak, spoke in front of police, the judiciary, lawyers, teachers, because you see, the journey of a victim has mostly gone understood. We are a victim-blaming society, and as women, we do that very well. You will have, every day in your hospital, 
one in three women presenting, maybe giving birth, may have phys- they had a, got a physical injury, may have a terminal illness. But the reason we come into a hospital is because we are vulnerable and we need help. The only time I was involved with hospital was, actually there were a couple of times when I think about it, was having a caesarean, an emergency caesarean for Luke. The degree of trust that we place in the medical people attending to us is enormous. A bit like you, Nellie, uh, uh, Minister of Hutchins. I didn't actually ask whether I was going to die on my caesarean. But I reassured myself and thought, can you imagine if this was decades before, women dying on a regular basis every single day through the pure act of giving birth. I felt very reassured that actually we've got, you know, things to take the pain away and I wasn't likely to die. I know it does still happen on rare occasions. But the degree of trust, and the other time was when Luca fell off those bloody monkey bars and broke his wrist badly and he had to go into surgery too. So you, you see us, you meet us, you are dealing with us at our most vulnerable and you remember the nurses and the medical staff who have a warmth and a humanness about them. You also remember the medical staff that are not particularly friendly, not particularly kind and empathetic and they can ruin your day just like I am sure problematic patients ruin yours. You know, I have a cousin and she's now, well, she's over 60, I think. She has trauma in her life. And it was the trauma of a three-year-old child being forced to go into hospital and strapped to her bed with pelvic problems. She's older than me, I can't remember it. Back then, back then, Parents were only allowed to visit at certain times. They certainly weren't allowed to sleep with the child. And her little sister could only look at her through the window. Benita was in hospital, I believe for over 18 months. It has permanently affected her. Thank goodness our culture within hospitals has changed because you see, patients aren't an interruption to your day, they are the purpose of it. Just like policing, family violence was just a domestic. If they turned out, they treated it as a noise disturbance. Policing has had to change. It is changing exponentially, but my God, it has still got a long way to go. Before you as a victim can be guaranteed to be treated respectfully, believed, supported, and then into, into possibly a court system where the magistrate or the judge will treat you respectfully, believe you, and make the perpetrator accountable. We are still on systemic, a journey of systemic reform. It's four and a half years since Luke was murdered. It has improved a lot. It came from a really low base. Everyone used to say to me, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? The implication is always that you should be doing more and could have done better and somehow possibly you may have even caused it. Our victim blaming attitudes are prolific and we need to challenge ourselves about them. Make no mistake that if you're too shy from having the gender ish, gender debate, you're shying away from reality. When Luke was murdered, I was very shy from calling this out. But I have gained a lot more confidence because, you see, the statistics are horrendous. But it's not meant to alienate men, because it's only some men that use violence. So we do need to work on the way that we speak, 
the way that we use the language. So it's not alienating people and driving people away. I speak mostly about violence towards women and children because that's my journey and my experience. But opening the doors of your hospital, you'll have elderly people who are incredibly vulnerable and often are dependent on the carers that may well be stood beside them while you're attending to them. I know we have one woman a week being murdered. I don't know how many children are being murdered every week. The risks are overwhelming. And the part that you can play is often overwhelming. Do we feel equipped enough? Do we feel we know enough? Well, as a human being to a human being, it's the least we can do to actually care enough to say, are you okay? I am concerned. Are you feeling safe? And to take the step by reaching out either to someone in your organisation, whether it's a social worker or a manager, and say, I am concerned about this patient. What are they acting like? What are they looking like? Well, I can tell you, I struggle with PTSD. I struggle with trauma. I have heightened anxiety. I'm also often depressed. How is this person acting, behaving and looking? Do they come? from overseas on certain visa requirements with little language and total so social isolation? Will they be alienated from their families, blamed, scorned and turned against if they disclose? Will their disclosure put them into further risk of harm? What is holding people back from actually trusting you enough to say, I need help? Well, one of the barriers for myself was I didn't even know I was experiencing violence. How could that be? Well, I never had a family and a lifetime of violence before. In my confusion with my relationship with Luke's father, I didn't understand that psychological abuse, financial abuse, and our intimate relationship in bed was actually sexual abuse. I thought because I wasn't being beaten up with broken ribs, fat lips and black eyes that my violence wasn't violence and in fact it wasn't bad enough. The time I reached out when there would be a significant incident, either having me dragged by my hair or my head pushed down or a kick or a thump aimed at me but just stopping short, was it bad enough to involve the police? I didn't think so. I was too scared of what he would say or do. And I didn't want to bother them. But when something got particularly bad, the first person I call are the police. So on your journey as a victim, when you stop really being able to talk to your friends, maybe your family, and you feel very isolated on your journey, your doctor can be a really great ally, a confidant. But how are they going to engage with you? Are they going to care in that 10 minutes or so you've got to a snatched opportunity amongst all the other busy patients? In your checklist of ask, are they experiencing family violence? Are you really going to get that disclosure if it's just a merely tick in the box exercise? Because you don't know what the journey ahead is for any of your patients. And you don't know when that person may be ready to reach out for help. And along the way, you can guarantee that the messages are consistent no matter where you interact. You will know that violence is never okay and it is always a choice. You have not caused it. 
This is about power and control. It is not caused by mental illness. It is not caused by drug and alcohol affection, addiction. But they, continue, they certainly can contribute and make a situation far worse and highly dangerous. When I reflect back of our previous Prime Minister, he did say something that I know would never have come out of Tony Abbott's mouth. And that is, not all disrespect to violence, not all <laughs> violence begins, I get this wrong now. <laughs> Can anyone finish it for me? I've got it to flap. Not all disrespect of women ends in violence, but all violence begins with disrespect. And I think that's what I really, really remind myself. That is our journey. This is going to take decades to fix. But as women, we need to be doing this, not just as women, as parents, as members of the community, as members of society, for your children, Nellie, for all of our children and our grandchildren. It's up to us to continue to strive for change and force this. And you may know that I've been, not just myself, but with the help with the Royal Women's, been doing some interviews over the last few hours. Because we have had very successful prog programs and campaigns that have changed our attitudes permanently. And as health professionals, you'd be very aware of the anti-smoking campaign. Because people remind me that at one point, people would wake up from their operation and the first thing they ask for is a cigarette. Well, I know as a non-medical person, as I drive around, I see them with their cigarettes down the road with their, whatever, what is it, the drip stuck to them and realise how desperate some people are to keep smoking but how difficult we've made it for them. So as Nellie said, if we keep looking ahead, it can seem an overwhelming and daunting prospect for the change we need to see. But look back and how far we've come. But for many women, and certainly children, this change will not happen soon enough. I'm not patient. I do not want a woman a week to be murdered indefinitely. And until I see that change, I don't think I can keep quiet. Thank you.